You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I bring back Gary Mishuris to talk in depth about value investing in today's environment, beating the market, and copying super investors like Warren Buffett. Gary is the managing partner and chief investment officer of Silver Ring Value Partners, an investment firm with a concentrated long term intrinsic value strategy. When I had Gary on the show last time, we talked about the concept of value investing that was popularized by Warren Buffett. And then in this episode, we dive a little bit deeper into that concept. We talk about whether it's actually replicable still and if it's applicable in today's environment. We talk about thought processes and we really just talk about a lot of great information in this episode. You'll hear just how smart and brilliant Gary is and and how he thinks through a lot of things. For me, when I hear Gary talk, it's just so clear that he's very objective in his thinking. He's really able to analyze things from an even keel without much bias, or at least it seems to me. I really like Gary's thought process. I like how he thinks about things. I like how he analyzes companies. I think you guys will be able to learn a ton from Gary. So let's get right into this week's episode with Gary Mishuris. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I bring back Mr. Gary Mishuris. Welcome to the show, Gary. Hey, thank you for having me here. For those who didn't hear our last episode together on episode 42, which I highly recommend people go back and listen to, it's one of our most downloaded episodes to date. Tell us a bit about yourself and your story. Very briefly, you know, I'm an immigrant to the country. I you know, came here about 30 years ago, grew up in New York, came to study at MIT, saw Warren Buffett talk about investing on campus at the business school there at Sloan Business School. And that was kind of my start in terms of my passion for value investing. Was fortunate to start at Fidelity at Nequity Research and have a great mentor there. And 15 years after that, started my own little firm, Silvering Value Partners. And here I am, four and a half years later, fighting the good fight. And in terms of value investing, which has been certainly a tough environment, but I think that I'm certainly sticking with it. And I think it's a great philosophy and it's a great process for those who have long-term point of view. We'll talk about how value investing has struggled over the last decade and your temperament and how you've had conviction to stick through that strategy. I want to start by asking you a relatively easy question, which I think I know your answer to. I think it's going to be yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the line of work that you are. So I'm not really interested in, in whether or not you say yes or no, but I'm more interested in, in why. Since there are people that believe that the markets cannot be beat, we're no better, they say, we're no better than monkeys throwing darts at a random list of stocks. Do you believe that investors can beat the market? And more importantly, how do investors go about beating the market? So actually, you know, let's start with uh, my um, end point, which is that it's actually pretty hard. I think we're all taught that Initially, we were taught that the markets are pretty efficient and it's impossible to beat them, right? Or near impossible. Then, you know, if you're a follower of value investing, you kind of learn that, oh, no, you listen to Warren Buffett, you listen to stuff, you know, okay, efficient market hypothesis doesn't apply and you can actually beat the market. So I think there's this point in the development of every value investor where they get a little bit arrogant, a little bit overconfident, meaning that they kind of estimate that it's a little bit too easy to beat the market relative to what it actually is. And then I think after years or in my case, decades of actually doing it, you and being humbled many times, you actually learn that it's actually pretty hard to beat the market. Yes, it is possible, but it's not as easy as it seems. And I think you have to have a few things in place to do it and that many people actually don't have those things in place. So I think the reason why you can beat the market is because I think that there are pockets out there where you know, inefficiency is pretty intermittent. It's not that it's there every single moment, every single day, but it comes there because the big pools of money, the institutional investors, and I've been, I was part of that world for 15 years. I started one of the biggest institutional investors there is, and I spent 15 years in that world. They just can't or they won't invest in there, right? So there are pockets that if you have a nimble pool of capital that you can revisit again and again, and occasionally you'll find inefficiencies. But it's not like, if you read a bunch of Graham, Buff, and so forth, and you have $30, $40 billion to invest, it's not like 
adapting a value investing approach is going to automatically give you a right to beat the market by a wide margin. That is not the case, at least not in the current day and age. We both talk about this quote unquote market. What exactly is the market? What what is this benchmark that we're trying to beat? Is it the S&P 500? Is it a broad-based index ETF? You know, what is in general do people classify as the market? That's a fair question. I think ultimately, right? Let's say you're an individual investor and let's say, I don't know, let's say you you have a business and you sell that business and you may, you know, you sell it for whatever, $5 million, whatever, you have a small business. And now you want to have that money invested for you. You can do it yourself. You can put it in some passive alternative, which is obviously very popular these days. You can give it to an active manager of some variety, right? And so the question is opportunity cost. So when you're trying to beat something, you know, you, you know, I have real life clients. I have partners in my partnership. I am trying to do better for them than their opportunity cost of similar risk. So now I perceive that to be a broad set of developed market equities. I don't invest in frontier markets, Vietnam, Africa, not because I think they're bad, just because I don't think I have, that's not within my circle of competence. So I kind of define my purview, if you would, as developed markets. And so I try to have two broad benchmarks over a long period of time, over a full market cycle of basically all developed countries equities. And that's kind of probably the best opportunity cost to someone giving me a hundred dollars because instead of giving me that hundred dollars, they could go and invest that in MSCI world index or the developed world index or something like that. So that's kind of how I think about it. But to be honest, because most of these indices are market cap weighted, it actually doesn't matter which benchmark you use unless you use some very esoteric one. As long as you use some very broad benchmark, they're all very similar over long periods of time. How are you tracking your returns? I've, I've been trying to find a good tool myself to use to track my portfolio versus the market. And I've, I've had a hard time finding one. I've ultimately decided to just use a Google Sheet and keep it manual. But I'm curious if you have any great tools that you use to track your portfolio versus the market. You might not like this answer, you know, but I think the best thing is to not track your portfolio versus the market over short periods of time. And the reason is that the more you're focused on how you're doing versus the market in the short term, and this is my hypothesis, I don't have any evidence for this that's kind of robust, but I think the worse you'll do actually versus the market in the long term, the market is going to produce some range of absolute returns. My view, and I think I can substantiate it a little bit, it's not certainty, but it's high probability in my view, is that from this starting point, the absolute returns that the market is likely to produce are far below the long term history. Long term history being kind of that 9 to 10% that all of us have been taught us to think about as what the market gives you. So I would say that if we get half of that from the market, if you're investing in some passive alternative over the next 10, 20, 30 years, that's a good outcome from the start, current starting point. So then you kind of know what the market is going to do in absolute terms. So I think that, that your best bet is just to focus on absolute returns. So I don't personally, in my partnership, I don't invest intentionally in investment that I think is going to produce less than a 12% annualized rate of return. Now, am I going to get investments that do worse? Of course, you know, like I'm going to make mistakes. It's, this is a batting average business, but I don't intentionally invest. So I'm not going to go and buy a bond that's go- yielding 5% or something like that. That's just not what makes sense to me. But, you know, uh, I think that if you start focusing and zooming in and like, hey, how am I doing relative to the market this week, this month, this year? I think that's going to start affecting the way you construct the portfolio. And you're going to start letting some dude at the S&P 500 or whatever let, help you determine what should be in your portfolio. So when the S&P 500 adds Tesla, should that really influence whether you hold Tesla or not? I'm not going to talk about Tesla. It's not my goal here. My point is whether you own Tesla or not should really not be a function of whether some person at S&P decides that it should be an index. It either is a good investment of you in your view, or it's not. So I think that I know it's not a satisfactory answer to your question, but I would say track your performance less against the market. And instead, track your portfolio companies against your thesis for them. Meaning, is your thesis, which presumably was promising you a high rate of return, which is why you invest in these companies, is it tracking? Or is there evidence that it's not tracking? Which, by the way, our minds are going to try to ignore the evidence that we're wrong and are going to amplify the evidence that we're right. So you have to actually go and seek out evidence that you're wrong, you know, with 2x, 3x, 4x the 
intensity because otherwise you're gonna, your mind's going to fool you into thinking that everything is fine when it's not. So I would say underwrite your investments to a high absolute rate of return, track them, make sure your thesis is right, and then act accordingly if it's not. And over the long term, if you do that and you do it well, you will beat the market by a healthy margin. We're talking about beating the market here, but what about everything that they teach you in academia about efficient market hypothesis? I actually got into quite a few different debates with my professors in both undergrad and grad school while I was getting my MBA about this topic of EMH. Yeah, no, it's funny you mention So I was, uh, when I was at MIT, I took a number of investments courses at Sloan and my Sloan investments professor was actually Ken French. And for those of you who don't know, Fama and French are the kind of the, the godfathers or the founding fathers of the official market hypothesis. Eugene Fama is probably the main founder of that hypothesis at the University of Chicago, but Ken French was his co-author on a number of the key papers. And I remember being in, Ken, in you know, Professor French's investments class 20 years ago, and he was, you know, he was pretty honest. And he was saying, look, there's an efficient amount of inefficiency. And I'm like, what does that mean? What does that I think in practice, what that means is that you have to have a little bit of an efficiency left for people like myself, who are managing nimble pools of capital, to be motivated to work hard and find those inefficiencies and invest in them, thereby partially closing the gap between price and value. Because if you have no inefficiency left, then everybody like me leaves, and then the markets just, you know, the prices are set by some S&P, S&P committee. The S&P committee has no idea what the business is worth. That's not what they do. So I think that the efficient market hypothesis is not wrong. I think it's really hard to beat the market. And the evidence of that is plentiful. I mean, I spent 15 years at large firms and how many large firms with tens of billions of assets, you know, under management do we know that have beaten the market by a wide margin? It's not many. And um, the other aspect of it is I teach value investing seminar at a business school and a number of my colleagues teach the efficient market hypothesis, which is interesting. So I was a guest kind of lecturer at one of their classes in security analysis, where efficient market hypothesis was kind of the default or modern portfolio theory was a default framework. And I think a lot of times, so, so if you were to go to Berkshire Hathaway's an, annual meeting, Charlie Munger, who's obviously far smarter than I am, he would have some you know, very witty statement about how anyone who teaches the efficient market hypothesis is an imbecile and and they're terrible, whatever. And I actually think that that's the wrong way to think about it. And the reason is this. So if you think about what the efficient market hypothesis crowd has done to business schools is that they've created an orthodoxy, meaning I'm not a tenure professor. I teach a seminar because I like teaching. It's not my main thing. My main thing is investing. It's, it's basically a way for me to give back to people and mentor them essentially. I don't you know, like if they were to fire me, not that they're trying to, but I would really not care all that much. It wouldn't really affect me, right? But if you're a professor on a tenure track and you're trying to get tenure in finance and you come out and say that efficient market hypothesis is like flawed or wrong or whatever, you're not going to get, you're not going to succeed. So there is this narrow tunnel vision of orthodoxy of like what you have to believe to be a professor, major business school, right? And that's wrong because the way I think we get at the truth isn't by having one orthodoxy. It's by having a plethora of views where we can basically have a debate between there's Eugene Fabor and French, someone who believes that basically what I do is worthless. And then there is someone like me who maybe thinks what they do is partially flawed or something like that. And we have a debate. And then the students can decide and people can kind of self-select based on what they think the merits are of the arguments. So I think rather than having an either or view, I think the stronger approach is to have both views or multiple views presented and then have people decide. But that's not what's taught, right? You have exams and you have to say beta is this and uh, you know the efficient market frontier, frontier and whatever. By the way, neither view is completely correct. There's not, there are many people who are trying to be the next Warren Buffett and we haven't had another Warren Buffett quite yet. And there are plenty also of examples of when the official market hypothesis kind of fails as well. But there are isolated examples. And again, there's not that many pools of really large pools of capital, which are beating the market by 5 10% per year. Just not. I'm not going to name them by name, but take a look at the major mutual fund companies and look at their returns. You know, they're not that impressive in the aggregate, although I'm sure they're very good at marketing the few funds out of their hundreds of funds that are doing well in a given year or three-year period. That's a different conversation. But in the aggregate, 
they could easily be replaced by a passive index fund, and they're being replaced by a passive index fund. So I don't think either view is completely right. I think the truth is this. The markets are mostly efficient, but there is enough inefficiency left that if you're managing a small enough pool of capital, and by small enough, I don't mean like you have to manage $10,000, it's probably in the hundreds of millions, maybe a billion, but probably and that's kind of probably the maximum. You can find pretty glaring inefficiencies. If you're managing tens of billions, it's pretty darn hard. So as a professor in academia, as you mentioned, you're not constrained to having to teach a certain way because you're not worried about tenure. How do you approach efficient market hypothesis? How do you explain it to your students if they ask you about it? Or how do you even approach that topic in general when that comes up in class? So, I mean, people do ask, you know, and I think the way I say it is, look, I'm not trying to tell you what's right and what's wrong. I'm trying to tell you how I approach investing. And I think, no, I'm going <laughs> to draw an analogy. So I have a personal hobby, and hopefully this is not in the too much information category, but I like bonsai, and bonsai are these little trees in the pot, originated in China, then carried in Japan. It's creating miniature trees in, you know, shrink, putting them in the pot and kind of creating an illusion of a giant tree in a pot. And the reason I bring it up is that it's a apprenticeship time. It's a craft. It's an art form that's passed from a master to an apprentice. So you go, and in Japan, you go and study with a great master and you work for him semi-slave labor for like five, six, seven, eight years. And eventually, you know, if you're good, you start strike on your own. So the way I think about it is that, look, you can kind of choose who you apprentice with. If you want to pursue things in terms of the official market hypothesis, I'm not going to waste my energy kind of telling you that you're wrong. I think that there are spaces like the blue chip mega caps in very large liquid markets like the US, where the efficient hypothesis is right most of the time. And then there are pockets of the markets or there are specific times in the market when prices are very inefficient. And I can demonstrate that with examples. Now, if I were a believer in the efficient market hypothesis, I would say, well, Gary, it's nice that you have these examples or these counter examples where the efficient market hypothesis fails, but hey, that's not important. What's important is overall, can active investors really, as a group, beat the market? And so there's this debate. And my point is, look, I'm not trying to represent all active investors. I'm just worried about, like, can I, using a value investing philosophy and process for my group, small group of partners with a limited, no, not that limited, but limited pool of capital, can I do better for them than their alternative, their opportunity cost? As long as the answer is yes, and they have both overall evidence and specific examples, I'm fine acknowledging that there's large swaths of the market where the efficient hypothesis is probably fine. So what I tell my students is this, yes, learn the efficient hypothesis and learn why that could be right, then learn kind of the alternative point of view of why it could be wrong, and then decide for yourself. And if you still want to come to class tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow. And if you decide not to, I'll still like you as a human being, then that's fine. So. I think I let people self-select and decide who they want to kind of apprentice under is, I guess, the answer. Is it safe to assume that the smaller your portfolio is, the better chance you have to beat the market? When you say smaller, I guess there's two. I mean, one is, I guess, one way to interpret the question is the more concentrated. The other is the, the smaller the AUM. I think clearly the smaller the assets under management or your AUM, the more you can tap into micro cap and small cap spaces where the irrationality of the market is amplified. It's not that the same irrationality is not present in the large cap space or the mid cap space, it is, but it's just there. It occurs for briefer periods of time and the amplitude of that mispricing is probably more muted because there's more people watching that space and constantly trying to find mispricings because that's their job when there's 100 analysts following GE or Wells Fargo or whatnot. And there might be, you know, I have some companies in my portfolio, and I don't want to get into specifics in the portfolio, but there are companies with no analyst coverage or one analyst. What has a higher chance of being mispriced? It's something that's not being priced by that many market participants. Now, if you mean your question in terms of concentration, it's a little bit of a dangerous answer because just statistically speaking, the more concentrated your portfolio, I think it's like Danny Kahneman talked about this, and it's like the, the law the small samples or something like that. Obviously, you're going to have more winners with concentrated portfolios, but you're also going to have more losers with concentrated portfolios because they're just more likely to be in the tails of the outcome. And so I don't want to say necessarily that concentration is the answer. 
Concentration is the answer if you're highly confident in your process and what you're doing. But for example, I kind of understudied under a person, Joel Tillinghast, the Fidelity, who I think of as one of the best investors in the world in a small group. And he has hundreds, close to a thousand investments. Now, some of that is because of the size of his fund, but he has beaten the market over a quarter century by something like three to four percent per year on tens of billions of dollars. That's pretty impressive, especially in the small to mid cap space. And he has, again, almost a thousand investments. So I don't want to posit that you need to have a very small number of investments. But what I would posit is if you take Joel and you were to clone Joel into two people and you would give Joel 30 billion or whatever he manages now at Fidelity to manage for Joel number one, and for Joel number two, same you know, fundamental characteristics as a person, same skill set, same experience, you would give him 300 million to manage. Joel number two would crush Joel number one. That I have zero doubt about just because Joel number two would be able to invest in better ideas while Joel number one would be forced based on the, just the assets he's managing to spread his ideas beyond his true portfolio that he would manage if he had the choice into things that are incrementally more and more and more mediocre. They might not be mediocre, but they're approaching mediocrity, right? And so I think that size is the enemy of returns. That is, nobody can argue against that. I think that having a nimble pool of capital is a strong positive, but it's not sufficient in and of itself if you don't have the right philosophy and the right process and the right temperament to actually implement that correctly. With nearly a thousand or even more than a thousand positions, why doesn't Joel's portfolio just replicate an index? Why doesn't it just offer returns similar to an index? It's a fair question. I mean, I think in some sense, right, you know, if he has a thousand investments and uh, maybe the market he's compared against has a few thousand, Essentially, he is selecting, this my, I don't want to speak for Joel, I'm, this is my interpretation of what he's selecting. He has better than average businesses as measured by return on capital and free cash flow generation. He works tirelessly, meets with management teams. My guess is he has a better than average batting average on avoiding the evildoers among the management teams, the frauds, the people who are just terrible capital allocators. So, you know, it's almost like a, I don't want to describe what he does as an ETF, but it's not an ETF. But it's almost like a he's selecting out the money losing businesses, the businesses that are bleeding cash, the businesses run by super promotional people who are trying to just get rich at your expense. And he's kind of left with the other thousand stocks. And in theory, over long periods of time, that thousand stocks that excludes those bad actors and those bad businesses should do better by some amount than the universe as a whole. So that's why he does better. But again, do I think that over the next quarter century, I hope he continues to do this for as long as he lives, and I hope he lives a long time, is he going to beat the market by the same margin as his first? No, because in the beginning, he was managing a few hundred million, then a billion, and a few billion, and then tens of billions. And if you look at his margin of victory, so to speak, it has diminished. Now, the fact that it is as big as it is, is a testament to the fact that he's an amazing investor. But the fact that it has diminished is a testament to the fact that it's just harder to manage tens of billions than it is to manage hundreds of millions. And that if anyone wants to come and challenge that premise, I would love to hear the alternative point of view because maybe I'm wrong, but I've not heard anyone say that it's easier to manage 200 million than it is to manage 20 billion, for instance. This conversation about Joel's portfolio reminds me of this question that I get from listeners of the show a lot. And I wish I could credit it to a couple of the different people that have asked me this, but why can't someone just pick the winners out of the S&P 500 and create their portfolio that way? You know, I get a lot of people, specifically millennials that listen to the show newer to the market. They say, you know, if you have a basket of 500 stocks in the S&P 500, why can't I just pick the 50, 200, 300 out of the 500 that I think are going to be better than, you know, and just drop all the companies that I think are going to be not good or garbage and beat the market? Why can't I do that? Why does or doesn't that strategy work? Well, it's funny. So I spent the first few years at you know, Fidelity and talked to a lot of peers and other very large mutual fund complexes. And that's what a lot of portfolio managers are trying to do. They're trying to construct their portfolio on a relative basis. They're saying, "Who? I'm going to overweight this. I'm going to underweight this. I'm going to overweight that. And so first of all, we know in the aggregate, there are a few Joels out there. There aren't many. But there is dozens of people like trying to do that. By the way, they all have fancy ties. They look good in a the suit. They talk on CNBC. And they went to Wharton or some other fancy business school, and yet they fail to beat the market and the fees doing exactly that strategy. And they have near unlimited resources. So it's 
They're not resource constrained. They have hundreds of analysts. They are as educated, they're educated to the teeth, you know, <laughs> to misuse a metaphor, right? And they're trying to do this approach and they're losing it. And here's why. The reason is that the frictional cost is too high. They're charging their 100 basis points or whatever in fees. And maybe there's another 25 or 50 basis points in trading expense, whatever it is. And they're probably a slight winner, gross, pre-fees, and they're probably a slight loser or a break-even after fees because you just don't know, you know that which company is going to do slightly better than another. So if you're trying to find these small edges, it's really, really tough to find these small edges where I'm going to be sector neutral and within each sector, I'm going to pick the, you know, the best companies. And, and that's what they're trying to do. But they're trying to do that because that's what the incentives are. And that's a different question because that from a marketing point of view, it's easier to have a hundred funds and have none do too terribly. And then if you do well, you market that and it gets Morningstar stars and you run advertisements against that and the flows come in. And then next year, when those funds don't do as well, they don't do terribly because you're close to the index and therefore you don't lose too much for that assets. That's a business question, right? That's not an investment question. But by the way, not a single investor who invests professionally that way that I know of would invest their personal money that way if they weren't a professional manager. And the way I invest my client's money is exactly the way I would invest my money because most of my money is in the fund. Now, when I was at Fidelity, again, this is not against the Fidelity. Fidelity is a good firm. I have nothing against them. Everybody used to talk about PAs. By the way, PA stands for personal account. Now, let's think about it. Why do we have personal accounts? Let's just pause and think. Presumably because we think we can do better than the funds because if you didn't think that, you would just have your money in the funds. Well, I don't have a personal account. I have my money in the fund. Why? Because I don't think there is a, should be a distinction. Distinction is forced by marketing and what's good for the business. And if you think that you should have one set of investments in your personal account, people will come and say, hey, this is a PA stock. What does that mean? What that means is that high, it has a high potential for return, but might get you in trouble with your boss if it doesn't work out. That's what it means. And so I think when people make create this, this dichotomy between what they think is a, the best set of investments and what they're putting in the fund, in this kind of relative game of constructing this portfolio, I think that you're giving up too much of an edge. And the market is just too efficient. And that's that's kind of coming back to your earlier point. Just That's the point, is that if you were starting with some huge edge of 10% per year, then maybe you could sacrifice 5% per year and do it in a way that's not optimal and still beat the market by 5% per year. But I think in this large cap efficient space, your edge is small enough that if you sacrifice it, you know, some of it, net of fees, net of frictional expenses, there's just nothing left. And the proof is, anyone who's listening to this, go look, you know, don't take my word for it. Look up these funds and pull up their 15, 20 year performance and pull up Vanguard or whoever index fund performance and compare who's better. From our few conversations, my guess is that this probably isn't your style of TV, but have you seen the TV show Billions? Funny you mentioned that because I did watch the first few seasons because my wife and I, you know, that was the compromise. She wanted to watch TV. So there's a great Seinfeld episode for those of you who are a little bit older than my age. The compromise is, you know, the, the man doesn't want to get a cat. The woman wants to get a cat. So they compromise and get a cat. So I didn't want to watch TV. My wife wanted us to watch TV. So we compromised and we decided for a while before COVID to watch TV every week. So that was one hour a week. I said, fine, Fridays, I'll watch it. But I get to pick the show and I picked billions. That was a long-winded way of saying, yes, I've watched some billions. Well, in that show... They talk about a PA and having a PA fund, essentially. They have their fund that they have for most of their investors, and they have a separate fund. I forget the name of it, but they have a separate fund for not even everybody at the company, just like their high-end executives are allowed to invest in it. And it's just it's a fictional example, but it's just that show is based on reality. And so it just shows that even in hedge funds and not even just at regular like mutual funds and fidelity, that this happens. So my theory, and this is obviously a subjective view of one man, but like the more products you have beyond one, there's a continuum, right? There's the business of investing. And by the way, these firms are amazingly successful. They make billions of money. They've made their owners into billionaires. So clearly they're successful, right? Let's be clear. And I'm a capitalist. I came from the former Soviet Union, which is a communist, which was a communist country. So I, I support capitalists. I'm not, I make no apologies for capitalists. So they've been successful in the kind of in the jungle of capitalism. But let's think about how that success is achieved, which is you have these clients. So I came to this country fairly poor. My father passed away at an early age and came with my mother and my grandmother. 
And my mother got a job fairly soon after we got here when I was 10. And as a teenager, I saw her researching mutual funds. She was making 30, 40K a year, single mother. We lived in a one bedroom apartment with three people in Brooklyn, New York. And it was really important to her to put her like meager savings into a mutual fund that could help accelerate her retirement, which she came here when she was 40. If you understand how compounding works, when you come here when you're 40, you're not a favor to retire early or even on time because you missed the first 15 years or whatnot, 20 years of compounding. So to her, it really mattered. So I kind of grew up watching that this example like that, hey, it actually really matters how the fund does, right? And so the question is, what's motivating the manager, right? So if the, what's motivating the manager is making as much money for themselves, then of course, they should have two funds, right? Or their PA and the fund. Or they should have 100 funds and then their PA. And the 100 funds, they will cynically like market whatever the flavor of the month is or the year and whatever has the most stars right now and try very hard to make sure the ones that aren't doing well aren't doing so poorly, which, by the way, the way you make sure that the losers aren't big losers is by hugging the index, right? So, you know, you again, that goes back to these small relative bets versus just ignoring the index in the portfolio construction process. So what ends up happening is you have, you know, this proliferation of products. And I have one product. Why? You know, like people say, why didn't you launch this? Or ESG is popular. Or this is like, why would you launch a second product? Because presumably, like, why not put the best of what you can do in this, the first product? Why create a second product? Well, you can slice it. The reason is almost always marketing. Like when you run your own money, you know, if you manage your own money as an investor, you don't have two products. You have the best portfolio for the best returns, taking into, into account the risk that you can find. And so when you have these products, whenever you see more than one product, it's marketing. It's never investing, ever. And if someone wants to come out and debate me on this, I would love to, because even like really good firms, like firms I respect, they might have a large cap and a small cap product. Why? Why not just have all the best ideas in one? Because they can, mar- they can blow out the large cap product to 10 billion if they're successful, and then they can close the small at two and get 12 billion. But if they had one product, they would have to close the whole thing at two or three billion, and they would make less money as a firm. Sorry to say that, but that's just the reason. It's just maximizing their own net worth. So going back to my mother, so when I invest, I'm thinking of people like my mother, and I want to do the right thing because ultimately, I just don't get that much satisfaction from getting some luxury cars. I'll be stuck in the same traffic. I have my Toyota Highlander. One of my LPs say, hey, you want to get that Tesla series? You know, if you do this, and I'm like, why would I get a Tesla when I already have a Toyota? It's comfortable. It's good for my back. I drop my kids off at school and it's just fine. And no, I don't want a Tesla. I'm sorry. You know, I'm fine with my Highlander. It's 2014 LE. And that's okay. You know, my wife has a Subaru for a second car and that's fine too. So my point is that if your motivation is to make as much money so you can be the chairman of some charity board and you know, have a bow tie at some black tie event and be important and all that, then maybe you'll have a lot of products and you'll do all of this stuff. But if you want to practice your craft and do it the best ability you can and have hopefully a positive impact on some group of people and organizations, then I don't think you need a lot of products. But that's my personal view. How does a fund like yours make money if it doesn't have multiple products? Well, I think that part of it is I restrict capacity. And I have a performance-based fee structure with a, with a hurdle rate and a deferral. You know, so I have a hurdle rate, which I think was an opportunity cost that my investors have. I think the whole hedge fund two and twenty or one and twenty, whatever it is, is atrocious. Because like, why should someone pay twenty percent of all returns? Because they can get some of those returns for free, right? So the, you should only pay for value added. And part of it is a lot of times a hedge fund will do really well in one year, and the manager will bank a lot of money. And then even if their overall 10-year record is mediocre, the money they've collected in the fees over 10 years is pretty big. And they drive whatever Maserati or whatever the fancy cars are, Ferraris, I guess. Uh, and there's a misalignment between how their investors do and how they do potentially. Now, that's not to say there aren't great investors. There are plenty, of, you know, or at least a small group of very good investors where both parties do really well. But they're also a larger group where the investor does really well because of a very unfair fee structure and the manager and their investors don't do that well. Or they don't do even as well as if they were giving their money to some passive you know, index fund. So I have a hurdle rate and I have a deferral. Half of the performance fee is deferred for five years, subject to a clawback if I don't exceed that, that hurdle rate over the five years. 
So I try to make it fair. I try to set it up in a way that encourages long-term thinking. I'm thinking in five-year-plus intervals, not five weeks or five months. And I think that ultimately, do you make less money if you're less cynical in this business? Probably. Probably the way to make billions to your, to your show analogy is probably to do the cynical things, which is you essentially, when you do the cynical stuff, launching all these products, you know, having an internal fund that's your best ideas versus the secondary ideas for everyone else. Like, kind of you're making yourself an adversary to the people who are entrusting you with their capital. What I'm trying to do is saying, look, I'm going to manage the money the way I'm managing my family's money. If you want to come along, come along. I'm not going to change how I invest. I'm not going to launch a new product. And if I do well, you're going to get the majority of the value add. I'm going to get the minority. And if I don't do well, I won't make much money. And that's the way it should be. But that's not the most profitable way to run it. And I guess I have the luxury of having started the firm 15 years into my career where I have a little bit of a savings kind of cushion where I don't need to try to maximize how much I make because that's not going to impact my lifestyle very much, I guess. What do you consider a concentrated portfolio? We were talking about that before. Is it five stocks, 10 stocks, 30 stocks? What do you consider to be concentrated? So, I mean, this might not be the answer you're looking for, but first of all, too concentrated is when there is one or two stocks that you're constantly thinking about, or one or two investments that you're constantly thinking about. So if you find yourself thinking about those investments disproportionately, that means they're just they're too, too big a portion of your portfolio. Presumably, if you're a good investor, you should have a good process. The benefit of having a good process is that it shines over time, right? It's going to have some not so good outcomes and some good outcomes and some great outcomes, and that over some large end, it's going to do well. So you should want your process to shine. You don't want to be dependent on this one decision. Because any one decision, the best investor in the world can get wrong. Warren Buffett's made mistakes, right? Not many and far fewer than the successes, but he's made mistakes. So like, you don't want to have a portfolio where you're really dependent on just one decision. So I think that too concentrated is when there's one or two decisions that are overwhelming the rest of the portfolio. Now, what's concentrated? I think that concentration is partially a function of the opportunity set. Meaning, if you're in a market environment where there's tons and tons of investments which are deeply undervalued, and by adding the next investment, you're not adding an investment that's less undervalued or much less undervalued than your current portfolio, you should be more diversified subject to your ability to actually assess those investments. There is a constraint. Now, we might want to hire 100 analysts, but I'm of the view that you know, ultimately, Fidelity has hundreds and hundreds of analysts, but for some reason... Most portfolio managers with the, using the same analysts haven't beaten the market by as much as Joel or Will Dano for a couple of other you know, really successful portfolio managers, yet they have access to the same resource. So it's not the resources, it's the decision makers. So the decision maker can only assess in a quality way so many investments. So I think that subject to your ability to assess that, if there's a ton of investments that are really undervalued, by all means, have more. However, in most environments, there's not a ton. And so what I consider a concentrated portfolio in practice is probably, you know, so I manage a portfolio between 10 and 20 investments, and it's probably close to 10 most of the time, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, something like that. That results in position sizes of 5 to 10% most of the time, occasionally 15 at cost. And that's plenty concentrated. But now you talk to someone like Charlie Munger, and he says, well, you find that one Costco, and you should put all your money in that. That's fine for that style, but that's not my style. And I'm okay with that. I'm not trying to be Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett or whatnot. I've studied all of them. I've learned things from all of them, but I'm Gary and I'm different than each of those individuals. And when I teach my class, one of the things I tell my students is, look, you're not Warren Buffett. You don't have his setup. You don't have his strengths or weaknesses or his experiences. Don't try to replicate him. And I know there are very well-known investors out there running around trying to be cloners. I think that that's not optimal. I think the best way is to learn from the masters and then think about your own strengths or weaknesses and customize a process that's best suited for you. And for me, I don't want to have one Costco. That's not how I invest. I also don't want to have 100 investments. So for me, about a dozen, 10 to 15, is probably about right, where no one investment is so large that I'm like thinking about just that one investment. But at the same time, I'm not a fidelity. When I started as an analyst, I would go to a portfolio manager, do all this work, and they would say, sounds good, Gary. I'll put a 30 basis point position on I'm like, 30 basis points? Really? Okay, does, what does that mean? You don't believe me? If you don't believe me, why are you even wasting 30 basis points? Do something different. It just doesn't make sense to me 
to expand a lot of energy and to do deep research and all that for a 1% position. But I'm also humble enough in my 20 years experience that I've been wrong many times. I'm going to be wrong many times. I don't want to have it all depend on one or two decisions. I want to make sure it's my process that over time that comes through. You mentioned before that there's, there hasn't been another Buffett. And I would agree with that. But I also, when I sit back and I think about this, not just during this conversation, but also just throughout my day, I, I think about this sometimes of, you know, is there another Buffett out there? And I wonder to myself, how much of Buffett's legacy is his marketing or the marketing that the media has done about Buffett? And I'm saying all this, I am through and through a Warren Buffett believer. I love him. He's my favorite investor. He's what got me in investing. So I'm not knocking Buffett at all. But I, I wonder how much of, of his statute, if you will, is from marketing from the media versus actual returns. And the reason I ask that is because if we look at just say, as an example, Renaissance Technologies, right? They've done what, almost 70%, I think 69% annually since like the 80s or something along those lines. It, you know, it's been an impeccable return for a very long time with a great track record. So that's not an individual person, that's a fund or a firm. So it's not necessarily like a Buffett. But when you have companies that are able to do this and you know, there's founders that come up with the strategy and the different algorithms that Renaissance is implementing, how are they not in the same conversation as Buffett or maybe are they? Nowadays they are, right? I think the I read the book about Renaissance that the Wall Street Journal reporter kind of wrote and the premise was that like the new best investor in the world. I'm not knowledgeable about, that, about the Renaissance, but my understanding from the book is that at least the Medallion Fund was basically closed to outside investors, right? So it's capital constraint. I mean, the, but I'm going to stay away from talking about Renaissance because I don't know, I understand the very high level of what they do, but I understand about as well as you or any of the listeners. So I'm not going to add any value on that. I would say on Buffett, you know, where I would say there definitely is real re returns. If you look at the partnership days, he's done amazingly well. However, and I don't want to say however, but like, the markets, I think, were somewhat less efficient back then. So I always want, this is a kind of factual, so it's impossible to answer. If you put a 30-year-old Buffett in the market today with $100 million in capital, how well would he do? I think he would do much better than the, than the index or something like that. But I just doubt that he would do as well as the Buffett, the 30-year-old Buffett did in the partnership days. That's my point, is that he, he was amazing. He was really, really good. But he was also in an environment where the returns... The markets were less efficient. Now, he said on the record that if he had a really small amount of money, he could compound 50%, five zero. But when pressed about what exactly that meant, he meant like a million dollars. And he said if the amount of money was increased to 10 million, the returns would drop precipitously. So maybe he knows some inefficiencies that nobody else does. A million dollars it works, but 10 million doesn't. So I think that it's definitely not all marketing. However, I think that he's also, I mean, he took public speaking courses. He is really good at this aw shocks mid midwestern kind of like self-deprecating style that was attractive right and uh, he's a good public speaker and there's definitely a lot of marketing so i think that of the biographies i read if you read the snowball that's my favorite because i feel it's the most even-handed one because it shows the at least it attempts to show in my view both the good and the bad the other biographies are much more fawning like oh this this is my idol and you know i'm just going to worship him Versus, I think, Alice Schroeder, who wrote uh, The Snowball, at least attempts to say, he's a man like any of us. He is amazingly good at some things, and he's come short in others. And that's true of me and many people, right? And she attempts to show like the full picture and, and so forth. So I think the biggest thing about Buffett, actually, is how he's evolved. I think I wrote an article for Forbes a while back about the evolution of Buffett's style. I think if you look where he's left other value investors in the dust, is that he has evolved from being a student of Ben Graham, statistical cheapness, just pure special situations, dumpster mills, whatever, right? Things that are just kind of completely cheap cigar bot kind of style investments to much more franchises and then from franchises to even kind of the growth side of intrinsic value to a degree, not to a large degree, but to a degree. And at 90, he's still learning. So I think that's where he excels. If you look at some of his peers who study in the gram, they kind of learned one approach and they stuck with it. And they did really well for decades, but they never really deviated from what they learned nearly as much as Buffett did. Maybe that was because he met Charlie Munger. Maybe it's because he read Phil Fisher's Common Stocks on Common Profits. But regardless of why, he was able to involve his process and still succeed at managing much, much larger pools of capital 
Whereas if you take the buffet from the partnership days from 50, 60 years ago, and you apply that style to 100 billion, it just doesn't work. There's just no dumpster mills. There are no 10 billion plus liquidations that I know of, right? So I think what I want when I teach my students, what I want people to learn from Buffett is not just the specifics of his style today or at any point in the past. It's how he has used the feedback mechanism of the market and learning from others to evolve his style to become better. If that makes any sense. I generally fall in the same camp as you do. And I just mentioned it. I'm a very passionate follower of Buffett, Graham, and Fisher. Studying them all is really what got me interested in the stock market. But it seems, at least to me, that as of late, nearly everyone wants to be a Buffett-style, quote-unquote, value investor. What does it truly mean to be a value investor? And what exactly is value investing? Well, first of all, value investing is lonely, even among value investors, because one thing that I observed when I talked to my value investor friends is that we're all value investors, at least in our minds, but we have very different portfolios. We tell each other about our own investments. And there are many instances of people drastically changing their portfolios to buy my stocks or of me buying the stocks that my friends whom I respect tell me they own. Now, why? Because ultimately, I think it's a lonely endeavor. And I think of value investing really as thinking for yourself. I think value investing, you know, there's a very difference between factor, the factor value investing. Okay, it's cheap on price to book or price to earnings or some other metric that's quantifiable. And the mental model that you're going to buy a business at a fraction of what it's worth because your perception of the cash flow stream or the worth of those assets is different in the market. And that's what value investing really is. It's thinking independently independently valuing the cash flow streams and the assets that you're offered in the marketplace and making a decision like, hey, is this attractive enough for me to invest my capital? Or how does that compare to my opportunity cost of other investments? So I think that there's, you know, it's funny, like there are funds that are calling themselves value funds and, you know, like in the mutual fund world and they're, they look like the Russell 1000 value. Well, that's not value investing, you know, like uh, the mega caps in the Russell 1000 value that's they're just kind of like hugging it just a different benchmark, right? It's like, does Russell really know where the business values are? If they do, why aren't they the, the next Warren Buffett? They don't. They're just a committee who decides based on some scoring mechanism that AT&T or some other stock should be in the Russell 1000 value and some yet another stock should be in the Russell 1000 growth. So I think that thinking for yourself and thinking about the business and what it's worth to a long-term owner is what value investing is about. And what value investing is not about is just some summary statistic, whatever it is. It's not, my portfolio is at a very low P on average. Does that mean that it has to be for you to be a value investor? No. I know very good value investors who have high P portfolios, but they invest in earlier stage companies and they have very thoughtful, independent theses on why the investments they hold are very much undervalued. I respect that. That's not my style. And so I'm going to stick to my strengths and do what I think I'm good at. But I think that it doesn't make them not value investors just because they're buying investments that are statistically expensive, right? So I think that there's a dangerous slope here, right? Where you can justify anything as undervalued if you torture the model, you know, the DCF or whatever model you're using long enough. So then that's a judgment call. And ultimately, over time, the results will show whether you're right or wrong. But I think that in general, I think value investors think about the fundamentals, not some statistic. And they think about, they have a vision of the fundamentals that's very different from what's implied in the expectations of the securities. And that could be buying a stock that's at three times earnings that they think is should be worth eight or nine times earnings, or it could be buying a stock that's 20 times earnings that they think should be worth 50. But it's thinking about the long-term trajectory of the fundamentals of the business, the qualitative and quantitative characteristics together, marrying the two coming up with a range of values and finding investments that are priced in that left tail of the probability distribution, if that makes sense. In what ways do you think people misunderstand value investing? Well, I think it's, again, I think it's, it's when people are dogmatic and they are looking for some easy formulaic answer. And like, I think the more rigid you are, so rigidity has a benefit. What's the benefit of rigidity? It's that it keeps you disciplined. And one of the characteristics that's intrinsic to value investing is discipline, right? Because value investors are trained that you don't want to be just buying stocks because they're going up or because other people like them. 
you want to be disciplined to your views, and that's good. But there's a difference between being disciplined in terms of sticking to your process and being dogmatic in the sense that defining value very narrowly, like I need to have it be low price to book or it's not value. So that's an example of when people misunderstand value investing. And then, and then also another example is when people are overly focused on the short term. Like I've seen a lot of value investing mistakes by invest, experienced investors who are buying really bad businesses that are clearly structurally at the breaking point, but they're cheap on last year's earnings. And so they fit their mold and they're like, oh, but they're seven times earnings or six times earnings. It's like, okay, but they have fixed costs and the revenues are kind of accelerating downwards. So in three years, they'll be at 20 times earnings, but not because the stock is going to go up because the earnings are going to collapse. And I've seen this, for example, with newspapers, you know, 10 plus years ago, when experienced value investors were copying Buffett saying, oh, newspapers are great business. They're a local monopoly. Oh, but And I remember saying, but like their revenues are melting. The internet is taking share. It's like, I understand they're cheap, but they're not the same business that Buffett saw in the 70s or the 80s. So you can't apply the same mental model because the things have structurally changed. And people are just saying, well, okay, that's, I'm going to ignore that. I'm just going to buy them because they're cheap and because the business used to be good. So that's one mistake. Another mistake, you know, and that's a good segue into like driving with a rear view mirror in the sense that, you know, so one of the mistakes I've made is, so a lot of times there are companies that I would love to buy at the right price. And they're rarely at that price. I wait and I wait and then finally they get to that price. And one example of that is Dell. Dell had a big competitive advantage. Dell computers, they would make computers to order. So they had a working capital advantage. They had a cost advantage. It was great. And that was true for a while. Then various things happened. People partially replicated the model. The total cost of computers came down. So having a 10% cost advantage in absolute dollar terms became a smaller advantage and all of those things. And finally, Dell got to a peer ratio that was attractive to me. You know, this was a while ago. And they finally bought the stock. A mistake. Because I was basically buying yesterday's Dell, but that wasn't tomorrow's Dell. And you know, that cost me some money. So I think that even Graham, I, I read security analysis, which I have it here because I reread it, not, be, not for show, because the security analysis right here, I read it four times and as I teach the courses, I mentor people. And every time I learn something in, in there, Graham very clearly says a value investor has to guard against the future. And what that means is that you're trying to make sure that there aren't adverse changes that are happening to the business you're investing in. They're making them very, their economics very much worse than their history. So I think one, you know, one example is waiting for these really expensive stocks to finally fall into your price range. But by the time they get there, they're broken businesses or, you know, certainly impaired businesses. So I think that those are a couple of mistakes uh, people make. And I think just coming back to your point, market efficiency, like value investing is really hard. I've done this for 20 years. And the longer I do it, the more difficult I think it is. Not because I'm getting worse, hopefully, but because I just realized all the mistakes I was making earlier on. It's, it's tough. It's not like you read Graham and Buff and all of a sudden you show up and you make massive excess returns. I think you have to work really, really hard. And then you have an opportunity to add value and, and generate excess returns, but it's not easy. That's for sure. For those that are watching the video version of this podcast on YouTube, you could see that Gary's book of security analysis had gold pages. What edition is that? Because I have two editions of security analysis, two different ones. I don't have gold pages. You called me out in the sphere. So this is like the security analysis. This is a special edition with the gold pages and the little bookmark. I think when I bought it, it was like $60 instead of 40 And if I, you know, if I were a statistical cheapness value investor, that would be a purchase. It was $20 wasted. But I figured I'm going to use this book quite a bit. It's not a book I'm going to like read on the beach and throw out or something like put away forever. So I just wanted, I just felt like I wanted to buy it. And so it was a, it was a splurge. It was a $20 that I spent. Now, sometimes these editions are worth, uh, selling for two, three hundred dollars now. Sometimes they're not, but it's, it's the same book. It just feels a little nicer in your hands and you have a little bookmark. Did I waste $20? Maybe, but I guess I'm okay with that. I like the aesthetics of the gold pages. I'm going to have to see if I can get my hands on a, a cheap version of that. I don't want to spend necessarily hundreds on it because it's the same material, but if I can find a decent deal on one. Yeah, you don't want to spend hundreds on it. So one interesting thing about value investing. So in my seminar, uh, one of the early classes, just to illustrate a point, I usually hold this book up and I, ask, I say, okay, the regular edition costs whatever, $49. or so what I don't remember what it is, but something like that. And I ask them to estimate, write down a piece of paper, what they think the special edition is. And the reason I do it is 
Because a lot of times people value invest, especially beginning value investors, they think that value should be the very narrow range, right? I show this and I said, look, it's gold. I mean, it's not like this. There's not gold nuggets in there or anything like that. It's just, just the same book. And the funny thing is the range of values I get. Now, I tell them like, hey, the regular edition that your, your business school provided costs 50 bucks, let's say. And I get a range from like 60 bucks to like 400 bucks. And I really enjoy the exercise because then we go on eBay or Amazon and we find out what it actually costs. But the point is that you had a range of like 8x or something like that between the low and the high on something as simple as a book where you already knew what the non-fancy edition costs. So if you ever come up with a situation where you have like a 20 or 30% range between your you know, worst and your best case for a business, which is far more complex than a book, you have to know that something is wrong. So that's what part of what makes real, you know, real value investing hard is that you don't know for sure what something is worth. It's just an estimate, and it's actually in a range of estimates, and you're waiting for extremes. And back to your earlier point of value investing and efficiencies and you know, large versus small pools of capital, you have to be very patient, have the right temperament to wait for when you get an extreme price. So like if I get this book offered to me for 30 bucks on eBay, I'm buying all I can buy. Well, because I know the regular edition costs 50, and this is certainly no worse than the regular edition. It has gold plating and a little bookmark. So I will buy it, and I'm going to be able to sell it for at least 50, right? But it's very rarely. One time I actually bought it for a client for like 40 bucks, and it was some charity bookstore that had it in a used but very lightly used condition. So it went to a good cause, and I bought it for like a value price, and I signed it, which I'm not sure if I increased the value or decreased the value in that case but he enjoyed it. So anyway, the point is that occasionally you can find this book for really cheap, but other times it's only available for three to $400. Is it worth three to $400? To me, it's not. But the point is that it's hard to know the precise value of, any, of something, which is why you need to use a wide range and wait for an extreme price before you swing at it. While we're on this topic of books, I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on spending the money to buy arguably one of the most expensive investing books that there is. And that's Seth Klarman's book on value investing. Do you think it's worth spending 700 to 1000 or more on a book, specifically Seth's book? Seth's been very kind to me. And I don't want to say anything at all that would be in any way perceived as being disparaging of his wisdom. And by the way, I think I've seen some prices of 2000 or 3000 for that book. So maybe 700 is good because you could maybe resell it for 3000 So Who knows? And that's not where I'm going with this. I think, look, I borrowed it from a friend when I read it. I didn't pirate it uh, online, but nor did I buy it. I thought it gave a very interesting perspective on the high yield market of the 80s. And I think to me, the key concept in that book, maybe this is worth 50 bucks or whatever of the 800 or 1000 or 2000 you're going to spend, is that the idea that to be an absolute value investor, you need to take into account tomorrow's opportunities. Meaning that when you're comparing opportunities, if you're a relative value investor, you're gonna say, look, this is what I can choose from. These are these 100 or 200 or 300 or 5,000 investments, and I choose the best ones. Seth says, no, 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 there's this, these 5,000 today, but then there is the likely opportunities that you're gonna encounter tomorrow. Then you need to factor them into your decision as to whether to pursue the current set or wait. And that's the difference in absolute value investor who sets an absolute bar for returns, whether it's 10%, 6%, 20 whatever the number is. And the relative value investor says, look, I'm not going to decide what the return should be. I'm just going to pick the best available, what's available right now. And if everything that's available right now sucks and it's only offering 5% returns, let's say for equities, I'm going to pick the ones that maybe add up to six versus sets inside is like, well, no, 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 I want more. I don't want to settle for that. So is it worth it to you? I'm going to let you decide because I have a lot of respect for Seth Klarman and I think he's both a wonderful individual and also, frankly, a wonderful investor. But I learned a few things from the book. Did that book change my life in some way that I'm a complete different investor? No. But was it additive to my process? Yes. So I think it's a useful book, whether it's worth three, two, 3000 to you. I think it's a function of how much money you're managing and where you are in your development. So I'm going to be polite and dodge that. But I didn't buy it but I enjoy reading it, borrowing it from a friend. You mentioned it back at the beginning of the episode that it's been a little bit of a struggle being a value investor. And I'm going to add that it's been roughly over the last decade that that's been been difficult because value has underperformed growth for the better part of the last decade. Is value investing dead? 
You know, so it's funny you mentioned that. So like I write to my partners quarterly for my partnership and my largest investor who is very experienced, he was a CEO of a large asset manager in his private you know, business and so on. His family office has some of its money invested with the partnership. After a recent letter, he said, "Hey, Gary, you know, I think I want to catch up on the performance." And I'm like, "Oh, is this like one of those conversations where, hey, Gary, I like you, but I want my money back?" <laughs> so yes, of course. You know, so we set up a call and kind of prepared my spiel. I made my spiel, and then I listened. And he's like, "You know, look," he said, "Gary, do you know that value investing as a style has underperformed for 17 years?" And I didn't count that precisely, but I. Knowing him, I know him. Sure, he's right. And uh, he's, by the way, he's a value investor. He's positively predisposed towards value investing. So luckily for me, you know, the conversation ended with, you know, he, I have his uh, trust and support. And, and But his point is that, look, there are these super cycles. And he's like, hey, Gary, do, you, do your clients really have the patience for some kind of a 25-year super cycle? So I think that there's two important points. One is, again, if you're managing a nimble pool of capital, you're not really beholden to how quote, value investing does. And earlier this year, I was able to buy a company that's now trading at a very high multiple as a growth company, because it is a growth company. And I was able to buy it, essentially paying nothing for the growth. There were two businesses. I'm not even going to go into the details, but the company was Covetris, ticker CVET. And they had two businesses, a legacy distribution business of drugs to veterinarians and a SaaS business. I know SaaS is basically, when I say SaaS, you should immediately pay at least 10 times revenue, just to be clear, you know, in the current market, right? Half joking. Uh, but they had the SaaS business that, in my view, was probably worth at least $10, billion, $10 per share as well. So we had these two businesses that were worth at least $10 a share in the most likely scenario. There was a range, obviously. And the whole, the stock you could buy for 5 $6 in March, April. Now, extreme time, but you could also buy it number of times this year for under $10, meaning that you could have bought this stock for the price of the mature business with all the cash flows and gotten the sexy quote unquote SaaS business for free. And now the stock is much higher. The point is that it's not either or. If you're patient, if you're managing 10 billion, you cannot do this. You know, company had a couple of billion market cap. I had a friend at a much larger firm who's an analyst. And he said, when I told him like, look, you should look into this. This is pretty attractive. He said, look, Gary, you're probably right, but we manage so much money that we need to wait for it to get a little bit bigger. I'm like, huh? You want it to be more expensive before you buy it? I know, I know, but my boss won't go if it's only a billion and a half market cap or some, whatever the market cap was. So I think it's a false dichotomy. I think that if you're paying attention, you can find situations where it's not either or. But I also think that right now, low interest rates mathematically favor growth investing. And for those of you who don't understand, and that's fine because I didn't understand until I looked into it, right? Is that for a high growth company, more of the cash flows are further out which means that as your discount rate drops, you're discounting them at a low rate. So therefore, the net present value for a high growth company increases at a higher percentage than for a company where most of the cash flows are closer in. That's just the math. And you can do it in a spreadsheet and test it out and you'll reach the same conclusions. If you don't email me and I'll help you out. I'm sure you will figure it out anyway. It's pretty straightforward. So rates can't really go any lower. Actually, I take it back. Last time I said that the 10 year treasuries were 2%, and here we are. So they could go a little bit lower, but they can't, I don't think they can go to like minus 3%. Otherwise, we'll be in a very strange world. So I think that value investing isn't dead. I think that you have to be, I think the spirit of value investing, what we talked about, independent thinking, analyzing the business, intrinsic value approach, and owner's mentality, long term time horizon, those are very much alive. Now, are you going to get the same return to a kind of simple, price to earning strategy or price to book strategy as you would have gotten 20 years ago. My guess is you're going to get lower returns if any excess returns just because there's a lot more computers applying that as part of their repertoire. So I think that you have to add something special. For instance, in the Covetris example I gave earlier, you had a business that was a spin-off that merged two businesses together. The financials weren't quite clean. So if you are a renaissance, you know, if you're a quant artist, trying to just process data, it might not screen into the in-basket of the hundreds of securities that you're going to buy. But on the other hand, if you're doing deep fundamental work, you can pretty quickly recognize that, look, whoa, there's a lot more value here under most any scenario, and you can buy it. So I think value investing isn't dead. I think that the returns to a kind of like a cool naive value investing of just multiples approach to value investing are probably greatly diminished. 
And I think that business judgment and judgment of management, what they're going to do with those cash flows is going to be more and more important as we go forward. Most investors jump ship and give up on their strategy if it hasn't worked for a while. How have you personally managed to stay committed to value investing with its underperformance over the last decade? It can be hard. I mean, I have a group of friends and we kind of call each other. It's like a support group. It's like, hi, my name is Gary and I'm a value investor. And uh, there was a period earlier this year where my portfolio was at seven times earnings and then I went to six times earnings. So five, like, in the short term, there's really no limit to how, how much cheaper cheap stacks can go, right? And in the, but in the long term, you're not dependent on the market if you're a true value investor. You're dependent on being right on the long-term fundamentals. So I think part of it is having the right partners, right investors. So I'll give you one of the things I'm proud of, and it's not myself, it's of my investors, is not a single person in 2020, or actually since I launched, Silvering asked for their money back. And when I emailed people in March and said, look, this, I see I'm seeing some amazing opportunities. If you have capital, give it to me because I can deploy it well. I've had a number of subscriptions come in. That tells me that I'm partnered with the right people and the right organizations. And so I have a friend, a good friend, I'm not going to name him, but he had one or two investors who keep pestering him and second guessing every decision he makes. That's tough, right? That kind of like drip, 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 drip. It's really tough enough because we're all competitive. We all want to win. We all want to do well. And when you have some dude emailing you saying, hey, uh, this stock you wrote up in your last letter is going down. How come? That's just not helpful, right? I don't have investors like that. And frankly, I started silvering having spent enough time and earned enough money where if someone were doing it to me, I would just give them their money back. And I would say, listen, you probably should be with a different manager. I'm not looking for someone who's on a weekly or monthly basis going to second guess every decision I make. I'm happy to take input. I know I'm going to be wrong. I'm happy to be challenged. But if you just constantly monitoring prices of every single thing, you're probably too short-term in nature for what I'm trying to do. So I think the first part of the answer is I have the right group of people invest in the partnership. Second of all is I deeply believe in the principle because the principle makes sense, right? Like buying businesses for far less than what they're potentially be worth rationally when they're at extreme in the market just should work over the right period of time. So if I buy business, something at five, six, seven times cash flow, I, was, I just bought something earlier, like two months ago, at three times free cash flow for a business where a lot of it I thought was essentially recurring. It wasn't quite recurring. I don't want to overstate it, but it was close to recurring. And so, and when I, by the way, I mentioned this stock to some of my friends, a larger firm, they said, well, but it's in a tough industry. But what happened? What about the terminal value? I'm like, what terminal value? It's at three times free cash flow, which means by year four, you have all your money back. And they're like, well, but it's in a tough industry. I'm like, okay, fine. I don't want to argue with you. It is what it is. Uh, but the point is that at some extreme price, as long as the business is not collapsing and the cash flow is somewhat stable, you will be proven right sooner, uh, sooner or you will be proven wrong. So if, I, if I'm wrong on my business judgment of how stable the cash flow stream is, then, uh, then shame on me. I was wrong, right? And that's why I have more than one investment because I am going to be wrong and I'm going to be humble about it and I'm going to learn and I'm going to hopefully get a little bit better but the portfolio will survive. I don't have any do or die bets in the portfolio. So I think that you have situations where you don't need the market's validation. You can buy a cash flow stream and say, if I'm right in, in three years or four years, this thing is still producing in the same level of cash flow, I already get my money back. I'm already a winner or maybe by year five, you know, because of present value kind of adjustment. So I think that there's that. And there's also, I think that sometimes people start their go out on their own too early, meaning they have the analytical tools. Let's say they were analysts for a few years, three to five years. They haven't seen the full cycle. Let's say they've read all the Buffett Graham and they are ready and they can analyze all their on Value Investors Club and they're putting up their, these really intricate analyses of things, but they haven't really seen how emotionally they're going to handle the periods when they're not doing well. I think that's a big part of value investing is temperament. When everything is going well, everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people can see what the analysis should yield. It's, well, what about if your portfolio results look terrible year to date and you have to report that to your clients and can you still execute your strategy? What about if next year looks the same? That's the question much more so than can you analyze a company and can you run a DCF or run a private market analysis or whatever. It's the temperament I think that allows you. And I, I have it. And also, frankly, I grew up poor. I, you know, I'm proud of where I came from and I'm proud of what I've accomplished. And I also am very humble about there's a lot more to accomplish and I can learn a lot more. And so I have a dynamic mindset of like, okay, 
I think I'm good at what I do, and I'm trying to get a little bit better every year. I'm not fragile where I make a mistake. I don't have one investment. I'm not being the roulette deal with my client's money. I'm trying to make sure that my clients get the benefit of the process and the temperament, not just of any one decision. Temperament is actually often coined as one of the most important traits of an investor. It's often even said that it's more important than IQ or experience. First, what exactly is temperament? And is your ability to stick with value investing a display of strong temperament? I used to play poker online when it was you know, kind of legal back in the day. And I read a lot of poker books. And poker has some important similarities to investing, right? And there was this great book on poker, which actually wasn't about poker. It was called The Mental Game of Poker. And it was basically by this coach who trained high-level poker players how to keep an even keel. Because in poker, there's something called tilt. And tilt, essentially what it means is you deviate from your best game. So let's say if you sit back in your armchair, your best game is your A game. And let's say when you're not fully rational, let's say you lost some money or maybe you want some money or maybe you have a upsetting situation in your personal life, whatever. Let's say your C game, right? You know that your A game, you're deviating. So the idea of that book is that there is the frequency of how often do you go from your A game to your C game? And then there is what's the distance? What's the magnitude of deviation? So your A game is your best technical game. And your C game is deviation from that. So how is your C game right here or is it right there, right? How far is it? And the point that book made that kind of was eye-opening for me is that most people work on their A game meaning they try to get their technical expertise better. Technical, I don't mean reading charts or whatever. It's like whatever your, your craft, they're honing their craft. But in the reality is, and this is going to be maybe shocking to some people, it's like I think that a good investor who can stay good most of the time is far better in terms of real market returns than an amazing great investor who is great half the time but deviates quite a bit the other half the time or even a substantial minority of the time. Because I've had people start in this business, friends or acquaintances, and they started value funds and now they're like running sentiment quant funds. And I'm like, what happened here? Like, I would have never guessed. Or I have another friend I'm not going to mention, but you know, he kind of in the March, April timeframe, you know, I think he kind of went on tilt. I don't think he would have think of it that way, but from my perspective, that's what it looked like. And I have another friend who runs a value partnership. I mean, I think he has like balls of steel, like he's having a tough year. A lot of his ideas aren't working out. Some of his clients have left him and he is sticking 100% of his process. You can agree with his process, you can disagree with his process, but I, hats off to him. You know what? I, I really respect him. I, I'm actually, I'm thinking of, you know, kind of giving him a shout out in my last quarter of the letter because I know people don't typically do that because he's like, technically he's a competitor, but he's more of a friend than a competitor. And it's like talking to him and feeling his pain. And it's like, and yet he's still coming out there and doing exactly what he thinks is the right. His portfolio is exactly what he thinks it should be. He is not letting the pain or the frustration or the lack of validation from the stock market determine how he's going to invest. I just have a ton of respect for that. I told him that. I'm like, hey, you have deep expertise in this, these couple of niches, but what you really should be telling your prospective clients is like, I have monster temperament. The problem is that if you are a prospective client, it's really hard for you to tell what my temperament is like. So it's really hard to sell that. Because the only way to tell what someone's temperament is like is to observe how they do when things aren't going well. Because everyone is, has a great temperament when what they're doing is doing great. So if you're some guy whose style is picking out the best SaaS company in the world, you are on top of the world and you're giving interviews about how amazing you are because you, you have 30% per year returns. Now, hopefully you know that's not sustainable, but you know it is what it is. That doesn't mean you're not good. You could be quite good, but you're just at the peak of your approach and what it's likely to yield. Nobody is going to generate 30% returns in Levered other than the medallion fund, which I think is employees only at this point or something like that. So my point is that having the temperament to whether you do really well or really poorly in the short term to just implement your strategy is so important because your process is worthless if you don't implement it when it counts. And it counts, like if your portfolio doesn't reflect your process, who cares what your slide deck says, right? Or what, who cares what you say in interviews? And so the, the friend I'm thinking about right now that I'm not going to name, who actually is 100% sticking to his process, whatever you think of his process, that's what you're getting. So the other people, who knows what you're getting? Their slide deck says X, but in reality, they're doing Y. And I think the only reason you're going to have that temperament is if doing the right thing for you is just intrinsically more important than money, than anything else. Because ultimately, 
it's like the old uh, survivor song from the rocky movies it's like you're fighting yourself you're not it's not you against the market it's not you against i don't know it's not value investing growth growth investing is you against yourself being the best version of yourself sticking to your process and at the same time slowly evolving and improving your process if that's warranted there can sometimes be a fine line between a true value investment and a value trap what exactly is a value trap and how can listeners of this show avoid them well, you know, I remember, I think, uh, I think it was Jean Maria Villard who said once that there's no such thing as a value trap. A value trap is just when you made a mistake as a value investor. But I think one you know, category of value traps is when you have a business, let's say the stock is at 60 and you think the business is 100 and then the value is declining. And the next time you look at business, your assessment of the business value is 80 and the stock is now 50. Next time you look at value is 60 and the stock is at 40. There's always a gap. So as a value investor, you train not to sell undervalued things. You're supposed to buy undervalued things, right? So you never sell it. The value keeps declining. And then when you look back, when the stock is at 60, when your value is at 60 and the stock is at 40, you're like, gee, I could have sold this at 60 two years ago, but my value came down. I didn't sell it then because I thought it was worth 100. That's an example. So one, so how do you guard against that? I think you try to find business companies whose value is increasing over time, right? The, one of the things my mentor, Joel at Fidelity, taught me is if you're going to have a long time time horizon, it helps if when the price to value gap closes, it closes to a higher value. So it's very dangerous to buy these melting ice cubes where you're really dependent on the value gap closing quickly. Otherwise, you're just going to have a, a wet towel in your hand, not you know, the actual ice that you were trying to harvest. And the second component is you really want to have a management team that's at least not value destructive. So as value investors, you are kind of implicitly or explicitly relying on a dollar of free cash flow being worth a dollar discounted to today. So if you have some management team that's pursuing dumb acquisitions or acquisitions that increase their comp but doesn't increase value, maybe in their hands, the value of a dollar is worth 60 cents or 70 cents. In that case, you know, if you calculate that the business is worth 100, but then they're going to turn the free cash flow into 70% what it's worth, then it's really not in the value that much, right? So you want to have, I'm not saying you need to restrict yourself to some amazing outsider CEO that's going to compound capital at amazing rates, but at the very least, eliminating the value destructive management teams and the businesses that are structurally getting much, much worse, right? So I think if you eliminate the bad and they have a big margin of safety for the rest, I think that gives you enough combination of margin of safety from quality of sources as well as you know, the actual price to value gap to avoid value traps. At the very least, if you do lose money, hopefully you're going to lose a little bit of money, not a lot. And when you make money, you make a lot. So you're creating an asymmetry between when you lose and when you win. And so one of the things I'm proud of, if you think about value investing over the last four years or five years or whatever, that I've been on, out on my own, there have been plenty of value opportunities, like think of retail malls or something like that, even pre-COVID, that have been complete implosions, right? There were smart value investors who were buying these and these stocks were down 80, 90% or maybe 70% pre-COVID or something like that, right? You know, I don't want to be Captain Hindsight here because obviously in hindsight, everything is very clear, but I don't have any giant losses. And that's important in a concentrated portfolio, right? You can't afford to have 10, 15% positions and lose 80, 90%. That's just too much. So I think that it's better to, I missed, I would say if I'm guilty of something, it's mistakes of omission. I have missed plenty of things and I do try to come back to that, learn from that and improve, hopefully. But I missed plenty of things, but the things I did invest in, you know, some did very well, many did okay, many did not that well, or a few did that not that well, but none did terribly. And having that asymmetry is important because you get value trapped into something that's down 60, 70, 80, 90%. And you're a constant investor, that's tough. That's how you end up with a record that you can't recover from. So I think part of it is being focused on not just the price, but also the quality of what you're buying, but also having a dynamic mindset about value. Because I think one of the things that value investors are guilty of is like they say if something's worth 100, they're anchored to that. The reason they're anchored to that is the following. Look, the sell say analysts, how they act. And most value investors are taught to kind of like look down on sell say analysts because, you know, sell say analyst decides what does he want to, does he want to recommend this or not? Does this outperform? And then he backs into the price target. The price target is like residual. And if the stock, let's say he puts an outperform on the stock and the stock goes after the price target, he just raises the price target, right? And value investors like, sneer at that. That's like, that's BS. That's not how I want to be. So the opposite mistake is saying, 
I value this business as 100. I'm going to stick to that, you know, come hell of high water, change my assessment as facts and evidence comes into play. So I think it's important to be both rigorous in your process, but flexible in interpreting evidence. And if there's evidence that something that you thought was worth 100 is now worth 40, it doesn't matter what you bought it at. And if it's stock is at 60 and now it's worth 40, that's painful, but you got to move on. And I think a lot of value investors are too rigid in their initial kind of assessment of value, and they don't update that flexibly enough based on the evidence. How do we know when we're wrong and it's time to cut our losers? Like, at what point do you say, okay, this is just, this has gone against me long enough, or it's gone against me enough that I need to just accept I'm wrong? Because as value investors, we could argue and sometimes rightly so, sometimes not. We can just say, oh, the market's not, you know, realizing the value that I see in this stock. Maybe I need to hold it a little bit longer. When is the time to just say, all right, I'm wrong, time to sell this position? At the extreme, when your company files for bankruptcy, that's a good start. That's obviously a you clearly are wrong, but that might be too late. It's kind of like saying, you know, when the you know the alligator is chewing on your hand, that it was a sign that you should have taken the hand out earlier. I mean, look, I think that you should look for validation, not in the stock price action, but in fundamentals. One of the things I do is I have this thesis tracker that I update quarterly and I color code it. You know, bright green means that the company in this quarter exceeded my long-term expectations by a lot. Light green means exceeded by a little bit. White means that it's kind of in line, ballpark. Orange means it's underperformed a little bit, and red means it's really underperformed. I don't give excuses, meaning COVID, no COVID, recession, whatever. I just, just factually, let's say I think this business should generate $100 in free cash flow this year. Right now, it's not on track for that. It means it's orange or red, depending on the magnitude. So like the actionable items from that is, for instance, if there is three oranges in a row, I have to reassess the value from scratch. And I cannot buy more until I reassess the value. So that kind of tries to save me from myself because I think value investors are notorious for averaging down in stocks. And again, there's this old joke of like the fidelity, you know, when a you know, portfolio manager who lost half his fund in the stock that was never more than the 5% position because it was 5%, went down to 3%, then he bought, moves it back up to 5 and so forth and so forth. And eventually, you know, just... It was just so anchored and such ego was invested in that, that you know he lost a lot of money in that one position. You don't want to have that. So I kind of have a circuit breaker where if there's several quarters in a row where they're underperforming my long-term expectations, I re-underwrite, I revalue the business. If there's a single quarter where there's really absurd deviation to the negative, I re-underwrite. Conversely, if there's positive deviation, I cannot sell until I reassess the business because value investors are also guilty of selling too early. The worst caricature value investor is the person who buys bad businesses that are cheap on the surface, but that deserve to be cheap, buys more when the stocks goes down on the way to bankruptcy. And the few winners they have, they take their winnings quickly and don't let and don't update their value estimate as the business becomes much more valuable. So I think, again, you have to be confident enough in yourself as a value investor to be dynamic in your appraisal of businesses. Because if you're just starting out, it feels a lot like lack of discipline. Like, wait, I thought this was worth 100 yesterday, and now I already assessed it and it's worth 70? Well, how can this be? Well, how can this be is things have changed, or you were wrong. So there's a quiet confidence you need to have in yourself to make that change, to say, you know what? Yes, Gary, you were wrong. That's okay. Ideally, you wouldn't have been wrong, but you were. And the next thing, best thing to not being having been wrong is to acknowledge it, do the right thing today that you should do, and then learn from that, move on. So I think that the way it works in practice is that you have to be willing to change your mind on things and not just go down with a ship no matter what. And I'm not going to name this person by name. They're a well-known value investor, but I'll give a hint. Joel Greenblatt talked about him and his notes at Columbia 15 years ago. And I was reading these notes in his, uh, from his class, and he was saying, this guy is super, value, super smart value investor, amazing, blah, blah, blah. And he came and pitched to these Columbia Business School students this stock, and, and he said how strong the business was, how undervalued, all those positive things. And then in 2009, the company went bankrupt. And out of curiosity, I was doing postmortem. I was trying to learn from someone else's mistakes. I kind of said, you can publicly look up the person's holdings. And they wrote it right down into bankruptcy. Like literally, they either kept adding or were constant turns their number of shares right into bankruptcy. You could probably have found a way to get evidence to update your value and exit somewhere in between. It's not that the initial mistake was, by the way, thinking that some business is so amazing and having it filed for bankruptcy, that's a big mistake. I don't remember Warren Buffett having a lot of bankruptcies. 
just so we're clear. He had like maybe he had a preferred or something like that. So it is a big mistake, but then you exacerbate that by going down with a ship and not changing your mind. I think that rigidity is how you really hurt yourself as a value investor. And yet we are trained as value investors not to change our mind because then we are flimsy and we're just like the sell side and our price targets don't mean anything. So finding that inner balance and having the confidence in your own process to confidently say, you know, I'm going to change my mind for this and this and this and this reason. That's the right decision now based on what I know now. And I'm going to act based on what I know that. And maybe that means selling today what I bought yesterday, as hard as that is. It's hard. I don't necessarily know the specific investor or situation that you're talking about, but my guess from us having talked about this before and then today is that he was just so public about that position that he felt he probably couldn't change his mind and he just wasn't willing to make that that change publicly. I guess I guess he just tied himself to it so much and talked about it so much publicly that he just felt like he wasn't able to change it. Maybe. I mean, I don't know if it's all of it. I mean, I think that's a component of it. I mean, I think that increases anchoring, right? But I think part of it is uh, just from what I know, and I'm very limited in my knowledge of this investor, but what I know about them is that it's a very rigid implementation of the value philosophy, right? And so there is this yin and yang of having conviction and yet being flexible. And if you have too much conviction, you would go down with a ship and you own the newspapers and you own the retail malls and you go down to zero and you end up writing letters to your, uh, your clients about how you stuck to your convictions as you went to bankruptcy, right? That's not good. I don't care what you write in your letters, but that's just not good. The, flex- the other part is that you always flip-flop and you change your mind. And at the first sign of the market selling the stock down 20%, you're out. That's not good either. So to your other question is like, how do you stick with it if the market disagrees with you? I think you, you focus on, you have a view of the fundamental trajectory the business should take and you mark the fundamental progress to that trajectory. And if there's enough counter evidence, you update that trajectory. You don't use the stock price to basically give you the answer. Although you can use it as a, as a warning. I used to know a guy who was a portfolio manager who had this rule that he would sell any position that would da- went down 15%, wait 31 days, and then decide whether to buy it back. I understand why he was trying to get rid of the behavioral biases. Problem is, what if the market went down 15%, 20%, where he sell his whole portfolio while well, he was ma- managing a mutual fund, so he couldn't. So then he decided to change it to a relative approach, like if the stock underperforms by 15%. But then maybe that's okay if, you man- you know, if you're buying these mega cap blue chips. But like if you're buying small and micro caps, they underperform or outperform by 15 plus percent all the time. They're less liquid. They move around a lot. And that presents great opportunities to someone who's competent and who has a nimble pool of capital who can manage money in that space. So if you're using the market as the arbiter for whether you should sell or not, that's a tough way to be a value investor. I don't think you can be, frankly, a value investor if you're using the market as a signal. But I think that you have to be truthful, like whether, okay, is the thesis tracking? And how are you going to track the thesis? And when I mentor analysts, I always say, okay, what are the milestones? Like, what are the signs that you would have to observe to tell you your thesis isn't playing out. Let's write that down now. Because then we can come back to it and it's less painful because we said, hey, if they don't hit these metrics in say two years or three years or whatever, it can be long far out, then we know we were wrong. Or we know there is a chance that, a good chance that we were wrong. And maybe that reflects itself in position size, right? Because again, it's not black and white. It's not like you either own it or you don't. You know, you can own, you know, so for me, I'm fairly concentrated, so my small positions are 5%, my medium are 10, and my large ones are 15. So something that's not working out, maybe there are better investments out there that can displace that partially. Maybe I'm not you know, convinced that the thesis is not working out completely, but maybe it should be a 5% position and not a 15 or a 10, right? Versus the traditional value approaches like stock is down, I double down. I think that automatic doubling down is a big mistake process-wise. I follow your work on LinkedIn and your newsletters that you send out. And one of the pieces that caught my eye recently was this experience that you had with your oldest son and a deck of cards. I think this illustrates a great concept for stock investors. Tell us a bit about the lesson you were teaching your son and how it applies to stock investors. I still have the deck right here. I'm not going to show you, but you know, it's, uh, I was actually doing my probability lesson. So I have uh, three kids. My Youngest Jacob is almost four, and my twins are seven and a half, and they're in second grade. And my oldest son is fairly advanced in math, and I try to, you know, I teach both of my twins kind of supplementary math in this day of like 
hybrid school and all that. They're public schools, so they anyway. So they can use the help, but he in his case he's actually fairly advanced. And I was using a deck of cards to just illustrate probabilities, and my youngest Jacob, you know, saw us and he was like, "Hey, Papa, can I play too?" And he thought it was a game. And I don't want to upset him, so I said, "Sure." When I finish with Ben, Ben is my oldest son, and so uh, I don't know if you have any kids or if people who are listening, if you have kids, but. You know, there's this enthusiasm that only a three or four year old can bring, right? You know, it's like joie de vie, whatever the French word, you know, like this joy of life. And the game was, I played with him, so I wasn't going to teach him probability. Three and three quarters, as he calls himself, he's not ready for ability. I was just going to play a game, a simple game with him. And the game was this, can you guess what suit the next card is? And so essentially, we kind of keep track of, I kept track of how many points. If you get the suit right, you get a point. And the first game, you know, Jacob kept getting it right much more often than I. He had many more points, and he was like, yes, Papa, I'm crushing it. And I was kind of smiling. I didn't want to say, no, you're not crushing it. It's just all random, you know. I didn't want to upset a four-year-old, right? Whatever, three-something-year-old. He had this big smile on his face. He was, like, so excited. And then the next game, I was ahead in points, and he was, like, his you know, smile turned upside down. He was, like, upset. And he was like, Wah. and And the truth is, it's all random. And so I think there's a lot of investors, and I, I kind of like when I see hedge funds or partners or whatever they're calling themselves, send out monthly updates. It's like, come on, really? Your marketing material is how you did this month. It's like, who are you trying to attract? The guy who cares about how you did this month? Well, okay, fine. So I, and like the worst part is not when you're trying to be cynical and sending out the monthly like performance updates, which I don't. And frankly, I don't think anyone should either. There's only one reason for them is to cynically like try to like market short term performance or at least to remind you people about them yourself in my view, the wrong kind of way. But it's like when you start to get affected, where you think you're crushing it because you had a good streak of like four months or you're being crushed by the market and you start your mental game, going back to our other kind of analogy of the A game versus the C game, you start to tilt away from your A game towards the C game because of some random streak of results where Joe and Blow trade some number of shares of your stocks, mark them to some price, and now you're either very happy or very sad. That's no more rational than Jacob at his age of not quite four being super happy or super sad about randomly predicting the suits of the cards. It's just not a good use of your mental energy. So I think you have to set yourself up, however that it works for you, not to get impacted by that. And that starts with like finding the right clients, communicating to them the right way. If I ever see a manager basically bragging about short-term returns, I'm pretty much not going to read anything that manager ever says. I mean, that's maybe a little bit irrational or harsh, but it basically tells me that they're completely cynical or they just don't understand probability at all. And that means that if they don't understand probability at all, I'm not sure how good of an investor they are. And if they're very cynical, there are probably other good managers who are not cynical that I'd rather spend my time reading. So I think that essentially set yourself up to focus on things that are helpful to your long-term process and don't create this emotional roller coaster. The market loves me. The market loves me not. I'm great. I'm terrible. I'm great. No, don't do that to yourself because you're just increasing the odds of tilting away from your A game into some version of your C game. Gary, thanks so much for joining me today. I really enjoy any time I'm able to sit down and chat with someone that is as smart as you about one of my favorite topics, and that is value investing. Where can everyone listening go to learn more about you and what you're working on? I have a YouTube channel. You guys can just search for my name. There's behavioralvalueinvestor.com where I publish probably once a month. I write for Forbes and silverringvaluepartners.com. You can name of my firm. And you can request a free owner's manual. Most of the people requesting them are actually students. And you know, I send out thousands of them. I'm always happy to send them. Uh, it's fine. I enjoy mentoring people. There's a form if you submit it. I will send you the owner's manual, which is basically how my process, how I invest, which the funny story is when I told my mother that I'm doing this, she's like, why are you sending this? This is your secret sauce. And I'm like, no, mom, I don't think it's my secret sauce. My secret sauce is actually the judgment it takes to implement it and the temperament it takes to stick to it when the going is tough. Anyone can write what they will do in theory. It's much harder to actually do it. But hopefully, as people are learning, this owner's manual is helpful to them. And it's the same manual that I kind of sent to my partners. And I started Silvering Value Partners to basically establish the ground rules, similar to what Buffett did in his partnership. They're saying, look, this is what I'm going to do. If you like it, I would love to have you on board. If it's not, I'd rather be transparent with you on day one than have you be disappointed later on. So those are some of the places. 
you want to reach out, LinkedIn is a place I would love to connect and uh, always happy to hear from like-minded long-term investors or people who are interested in learning about it. I have read through the owner's manual and I can vouch that it is a great document and a great learning resource. So if you guys are interested in learning more about that, definitely take Gary up on that offer to reach out to him, submit the form so that you can get a copy of that. It's great reading material. I, I highly recommend it. I'll put a link to all of Gary's resources that he just mentioned in the show notes below in your favorite podcast player. So you can click those links, access any of those resources for free. And if you haven't heard our last episode together, you can go check that out on episode 42 of this podcast, the Millennial Investing Podcast. Gary, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thank you so much for having me and happy value investing. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Millennial Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.